<laughs> Good evening, everyone. If you'd like to take your seats, we can get started right away here. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Jasper Dent. I'm the events coordinator here at McNally Robinson in Saskatoon. This event is being held on Treaty 6 territory, which is the land of the Cree, Dene, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Saskatoon launch of The Good Walk by Matthew R. Anderson. We've got quite an event for you here tonight. Uh, we've got a musical performance by Dave Sisa and Tom Kennedy. Uh, we've got a poetry reading by Sky Dancer Louise Briggs Half. And this event is also in partnership with the Saskatchewan History and Folklore Society. And Kristen Enns Kavanaugh from SHFS will be hosting our QA at the end here. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to make a couple notes. One, this event is being live streamed, so please be aware of the web camera up to the front, to your right here. Just try not to block it, it's fairly out of the way and should be fine. I'd also like to take this moment to remind you all to silence your phones. You don't want to be the person whose phone goes off in the middle of the event. All right, to start us off, I'd like to introduce Dave Sisa, who is a local folk musician, uh, originally from Swift Current. He now lives in Saskatoon, and we're very glad to have him here. I'm glad he brought his guitar with him. Uh, Dave's put out two albums, a solo album and an album with his band Creek City, which is based in Swift Current. And he's joined tonight by Tom Kennedy, also known as TWA Kennedy, who is a multi-instrumentalist and local musician who has also put out multiple albums. And he is going to stand with us tonight with the mandolin. All right, good. take it away, Dave and Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jasper, um, and thank you, Matthew, for inviting me to this event. Um, and um, I'm very happy to be here to uh, to share with you a couple of my songs that I've written. Um, uh, the first one I'm going to do um, was inspired by doing some of the walks that uh, Matthew's going to talk about tonight. One in particular was... Um, a walk we did uh, in the Grasslands Park. Uh, we, we did a couple of hikes in the park uh, one day, and then we, we walked along the Frenchman Valley to Cypress Lake, and uh, then through the Cypress Hills and to Fort Walsh. Uh, very pretty country, and um, it gets your mind rolling about um, what you can put into a song. And, um, I spent a bit of time in the Grasslands Park in 2017 as a musician in residence, and so that got me thinking about this type of song as well. And uh, anyway, um, enough of that. Um, this is a song called Take Me Back. There's a path down to the water from where I step inside this deep rain. There's a flute that listens in the distance. Close your eyes, imagine spirits sing. Take me back where I can feel the very sound. Take me back before I leave me come undone. Take me back to the land of the living skies. Oh, take me back. Here we all be long. sounds of the sand hill cranes as they drift by clouds of every shape. Like the thunder sounds 
of the pride of the sinners as they travel over the grasslands to escape. Take me back, I can feel the prairie sun. Take me back, or I become a dummy. Take me back to the land of the dirty skies. Take me back to where we all belong. I sit beside a boiling fire. I see the owl that swoops to greet the night. Hear the howling of the coyote choir. Take me back. I can feel the prairie sun. Take me back. Or I'd be from a dome. Take me back to the land of the living sky. Take me back to where we all belong. Take me back to where we all belong. So yeah, um, normally I need two songs to get over my nervousness, and I'm only doing two songs. So uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to continue on with my second song here. Um, some of you heard this. Some of the the people that I've walked with in the past, uh, we usually had a campfire, and I uh, I played this song for you a few times. Uh, it was it was inspired by walking part of the Camino de Santiago in Spain. Um, I was lucky enough to do that in 2015. Um, my wife Jean uh, went to a language school for two weeks, and I I went walking for two weeks. Um, started out in the city of Leon and walked to Santiago, and it took me 13 days. I covered 325 kilometers, uh, 25 kilometers a day. So. I was pretty happy with that, and it was a great experience. Um, and as I was walking, I, I noticed a, a blue garbage can, a blue plastic garbage can with um, uh, it was written on the on the can uh, in bl big black letters. Um, Imagine there is no heaven. And um, walked a little further, and there's another garbage can, and on it was written in black letters, "It's easy if you try." Walked a little further, and another garbage can that said, no hell below us. And then a little while later, another garbage can with the phrase, what? Above us only sky. Correct. So, above us only sky. And so I got thinking about John Lennon's song, Imagine, and how he wanted us to get uh, come together as one and how the Camino de Santiago was bringing people from all over the world to be as one. And um, I um, was thinking about this song as I was walking, and then when I um, got on the train to go back to Salamanca to meet up with Jean, I started scribbling out the lyrics, and I came up with this song. It's called The Way. <laughs> Thank you. 
All starts out with baby steps. Your mother's arms reach out. You walk into this great big world full of wonder and of doubt. As you make your way down pathways, alone or hand in hand, balancing on stepping stones as you try to understand. With tired feet and blisters, you like to feel the pain. Cause in the morning you may wake and never walk again. Like a surgeon with a steady hand, you pick up scallop shells. Shed a tear with the friend of the story that he tells. John Lennon sang imagine on the bottom of his heart. He wanted us to be his one. All we have to do is start. You can walk into San Diego celebrate with friends, but your footsteps will continue on, because the way it will never end. If you look inside your backpack, you will see your fears. You carry things that comfort you as you trundle through the air. Grand and gold cathedrals, smell the incense burn. And watch the smoke in spirals rising up with every turn. John Lennon said he could imagine on the bottom of his heart. He wanted us to be his one. All we have to do is start. To walk into Santiago, celebrate the friend. But your steps will continue on, because the way it never ends. John Lennon said he could imagine from the bottom of his heart. He wanted us to be his one. All we have to do is start. You can walk into Santiago. Celebrate with breath. But your footsteps will take the blood. Does the way it never end? Does the way it never Thank my good buddy Tom for joining me here today. Give him a hug. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the evening.
thank you again to Dave and Tom. It turns out it takes about two songs for me to get over my nerves too, so I might have to hire you guys for this one. So, uh, we'll talk about that later. For now, I'd like to introduce Matthew Anderson. Uh, Matthew was born to settlers on Treaty 4 territory near the Cypress Hills area. He now teaches part-time at both St. Francis Xavier and Concordia Universities. Anderson is the author of several books, including Our Home and Treaty Land with Ray Aldred. He hosts the podcast Pilgrimage Stories from Up and Down the Staircase, and more of his work can be found at somethinggrand.ca and unsettledwords.com. He is, of course, the author of the book that is the feature of this evening, The Good Walk. Everyone, please give Matthew a very warm welcome. It's always good for a musician to uh, to stop when people want more, but I, I'm sure that you, like me, wanted a lot more, <laughs> and we're disappointed when the when the music stopped. I will also say that on the walk from Mortlock, so Mortlock, Saskatchewan, south to Gravelberg, Saskatchewan, Mortlock is a community uh, not far out of Moose Jaw, so south of uh, the number one highway headed toward uh, Gravelberg. There was one night where uh, Dave was playing guitar and sounding just as mellow and beautiful as that. Uh, we were all sitting around and uh, then he got tired and people were going, no, play more, play more. And he handed me the guitar because he knew that I played you know, some chords. And I said, you go on. And uh, so this time I'm not following you on guitar. That was kind of a disaster. <laughs> I think I'll just talk. <laughs> um, so my thanks, uh, my thanks to, uh, I wanted to say a couple of words of thanks, Jasper, uh, Dan, to Jasper and to, uh, thank you to you and to McDally Robinson for uh, hosting this event here in Saskatoon and also uh, the events in Winnipeg, which was uh, lovely as well. So the two store, thank you, the two stores. Um, I also wanted to um, thank Kristen um, and the Saskatchewan History and Folklore Society. And we were talking, you know, are they sponsors? Are they partners? And the true answer is both sponsors and partners because Saskatchewan History and Folklore Society um, have been responsible for the walks um, that uh, are described in this book and then that continued on after this book uh, officially since the second walk. But even from the very beginning, as you will find out, uh, Hugh Henry, who is uh, uh, deeply involved in Saskatchewan history and folklore, uh, has been the uh, uh, the driving force behind uh, making sure that these things happen. It's, it's great to be an idea person, but just being an idea person is rarely this, the, the finish to a successful project. <laughs> it's one thing to have an idea, it's another thing to have it come to fruition. And Hugh has always been the person who has brought these ideas to fruition. Now, if you don't know what these ideas are, hold on for a minute, we'll, we'll talk about what happens. Um, I also wanted to um, to thank uh, uh, Dave and, and Tom for the music officially. Thank you both for doing that. Um, and I wanted to uh, thank University of Regina Press, of course, for, for taking on the book and for publishing The Good Walk. Um, and finally, uh, you are going to hear the incredible poetry of Louise Bernice Half, Sky Dancer. And uh, we were first going to have her read right at the beginning. Uh, and then I realized that in the book, her poetry is, is woven throughout the book in, in various places, and that it felt more organic to have you to read uh, throughout this evening's talk and, uh, and readings. And so uh, she kindly agreed to that. But we're walking companions, and, and I... And the poetry has been an inspiration to me, and I imagine to some of many of you, to many of you, um, uh, throughout the years. Now, it is fun to be uh, able to be here with someone whose picture is actually on the wall of the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so my goal someday, maybe, <laughs> is, to, is to do that. So um, if you haven't seen it yet, go take a look for a dessert afterward. This is right now. <laughs> Um, so what I thought we would do then is to have a couple of readings. Uh, I'll start with the reading, and then we're going to, uh, Kristen has, has agreed to do some Q&A stuff. So I'll do one reading to start with, I think. Um, the preface for the book. The preface for the book was written by uh, my friend uh, Richard Cottowich of Regina. Uh, Richard was one of the first people that I talked, besides Hugh, one of the first people I talked to about doing this walk, these walks. 
So what, what is it about? The walks were uh, described in the book were long walks in the case of the first two, uh, about 350 kilometers from, in the first case, 2015, from Wood Mountain to Cypress Hills. So imagine Wood Mountain to Cypress Hills. And then in 2017, from uh, Battleford, uh, sorry, from Swift Current North toward Battleford, to Battleford. And why did we do them? Well, that's going to come up in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, uh, who did them? Um, a, a, a motley crew of people, essentially. Um, but at the backbone of that was myself and Hugh walking at first. But also this gentleman, Richard Cotterwich, one of the first people I asked was I went to Regina and I asked him to go out for uh, coffee with me. And we sat not far off of Albert Street, if I remember correctly. And I said, um, I'm, would you be interested in walking from Wood Mountain to Cypress Hills? Which is a crazy question. And Richard is was a crazy kind of a fellow too. And he said, sure. He needed a little more convincing, but eventually by the end of that coffee, he said, yes, I would. And Richard was uh, on that first walk, was somebody who constantly guided us. He, he, we wound up um, both with Richard and then later on with uh, Louise and Peter. Um, the kind of morning ceremony that guided our way and prepared us for the day was smudging. And uh, Richard led most of those first uh, walks of smudges. And um, and he was a kind of a person who would, he would talk about the smudge, he would talk about Indigenous education, because that was his career. And um, he would talk about Heidegger, and then he'd go back and talk about 17th century French philosophy, and then he would talk about grandfather stones. You never quite knew what was going to come next. Uh, um, and that was part of the joy of walking with Richard. Um, Richard passed away in, I think, in February of this year. And one of the things that was a disappointment to me was that he never got, he wrote the preface for this, but he never got to hold the book in his hands. He did get to see the proofs. And so he knew that he was uh, shot through the pages of this of this book. But I want to read one, one thing uh, in the kind of odd, uh, eclectic spirit of Hugh. I'd like, I'm sorry, Hugh. I was looking at you, that's my question. Oh, Richard, there, there's an odd eclectic spirit there as well. Um, uh, but uh, I would like to read something about uh, Richard. And that is, uh, okay, here we are. So uh, how, how many of you have been uh, around El Rose area? You know El Rose when I say El Rose? Yeah? Okay. So on Highway 4, I guess, south from Rose down towards Fifth Current, halfway-ish, something like that. Uh, so near El Rose is a place called Otter's Station. Very important name, Otter's Station, that you have to read the book to find out why. But here it goes. On our return to Otter's Station, we were met by Lauren Kelsey, a local farmer. Richard led a smudge near one of the pools of water. He noted that there's a spring, and others like it. So there's a spring of water there. And others like it, before they had settler and especially military names, were and are significant to the people who for millennia have used the hills for, sh for hunting and for shelter. In other words, indigenous peoples. As often happened on our walks, Richard and I lingered in discussion as the rest of our group moved off. We were talking about the fact that although we had seen no offerings in this particular locale, tobacco in little pouches of brightly colored material can sometimes still be found hanging in the bushes around such springs. Indigenous peoples have not forgotten them. It's a spiritual place. Can you feel it? People have been drinking the water from this stream for who knows, centuries, Richard said. I began hoisting my backpack over my shoulders and adjusting my straps. Richard gestured for me to stay. He was looking at some rivulets of liquid meandering between the soggy humps of earth. By this point, the rest of our group were examining a slightly caved in hollow in the side of one of the North Hills, probably the location of Klinskill's stop. Klinskill was uh, a, a trader from North, from Battleford who uh, had taken the, the coach, that is the wagons, to go back and forth to Swift Current and, and wrote about it in his diary. And he, he, he talks about this stop at, at uh, Otter's station. Back to Richard. Water is life. This spring is life. Richard spread his arms wide. He had his arms up like this. Under 
Under his jacket, he was wearing a blue t-shirt emblazoned with the infinity symbol of the Métis. Come on! He surprised me by dropping Spread Eagle to the ground. We can't leave before we drink some. Everything was soggy. The tufts of grass were muddy, wiped by the hooves of the recently departed cattle that I feared were likely at that moment grazing, defecating, upstream. I looked with horror at the slow-moving, muddy liquid. It looked nothing like a spring of life to me, more like a spring of dysentery. Already Richard had his hand in the gravy. Uh, I don't know, hesitated. You can do it, Richard insisted, always enthusiastic. His voice muffled now by the grass. This is the water that has kept generations alive. And then after that, the water that fought, brought the first settlers to this hill. This is living history. I got on my knees reluctantly. I was not at all sure that I could manage to get my mouth close to the buck. I took a tentative swallow, letting most of the rest dribble through my fingers. I couldn't imagine why anyone would make a stop for this stuff. But Clintscale had. It had been apparently the perfect place to host horses and travelers overnight. Richard was standing again, his pack on, enthusiastic. That was great, he said, and smiled. He sauntered downhill toward the others. Be there in a second, I called. When I was alone, I rummaged deep in my pack. My wife, Sarah, had surprised me by packing a tiny bottle of scotch into my bag for the trip. I hadn't opened it. It was I think we were almost the weekend, and I hadn't opened it. But this seemed to be the perfect occasion. I took a mouthful of the 40% alcohol, gargled, and spat it out. <laughs> and then I swallowed a mouthful more, just to be sure. I was clearly a settler to the core and a man of no faith. Nonetheless, it seemed wise when post-settlement cattle were upstream to take this bit of history with an antiseptic chaser. I hurried to catch up with the others. <laughs> That's a memory break. Um, if I could say something then about the walks, I'll just say something quickly, which is that um, the, the good walk is the story of three of, of, of many, of well, not many more, but of more walks that were taken across the prairies. And um, I hope that we will talk a little bit about how that came to happen and why a group of people, you, if you take a look at the cover, you'll see that there are, at first it looks like there are six people on the cover, but there are actually seven because uh, Hugh, Harold is not letting Hugh out of his sight in this. And there are two people, one behind another on there. And I'm right there. And um, the, these walks are very different. Have any of you read uh, Cheryl Strayed? Uh, what's it called? Yeah, Wild? Wild? Yeah. How many people have read that? It's a good book. How many people have read other uh, walking books? Now, I'm going to ask you, um, how many of those books are about individual walkers? One person who sets out. There's nothing wrong with an individual walking book at all. I don't I don't want to say anything wrong, but they're great books, and I've read many of them myself. This is not one of those. It's right on the cover. There's seven of us, and that was one day. The next day we had more because when we set out from East End, some days we had less. Uh, Hugh and I, when we set out from uh, Val Marie, uh, the uh, middle of the afternoon, it was just you and I at that time. Um, so the numbers fluctuated, but it was never ever a solo effort. And uh, you can see again in the in the music, Dave, who walked with us. Uh, you know, we gathered around. There was always community. There was always community of some sort. And that community, it didn't mean that you didn't walk by yourself sometimes, but you walked by yourself and you came together and talked to others, and then you walked by yourself and you came together. It was always a community effort. And it's all, also, it had a community purpose, a memory in community, a memory about community, memory of breaking community, and memory of trying to rebuild it. So I'll stop there and maybe... Maybe that's a great time to, to start. Would you be welcome? So I'd like to introduce you to a friend and a fellow walker and uh, former poet laureate of Canada. How many people can say that? Um, and a great poet. Uh, please welcome. Please help us get an answer.
que no nos ofende nadie, que no nos ofende isla, 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 que Skeletons, horse skeletons, and David would say, I know a song for that. <laughs> <laughs> the horse with no name. <laughs> so we took the skeleton bones and they were our percuss percussions. Yeah, we sang that song. So it was lovely. And of course, I um, want his car. <laughs> it, it's a really nice band. <laughs> and uh, Hugh Henry, I met him at Swift Current the first time when he was doing um, a, a slide presentation of Saskatchewan. And that's where I met David and his wife. And I signed up right away. I thought, of course, like, I can't think of anything better to do with my holidays. Saskatchewan walks. Saskatchewan has so much diversity and so much beauty. Uh, you don't really appreciate it until you're walking it. Like we could drive by and, we, and you know, we could see the um, the people and the dog running for three days, right? That's the common expression. But um, so I'm really grateful for you and the people that I have met on these walks have left big impressions. But I had to watch my attitude, okay? Because history is in my bones and it's in long time ago I wrote, um, the prairie is full of bones. I feel my ancestors because that's what this province and this country is made of, is my ancestors. And so I, I thought of them as living entities and I think of them as living entities. And um, I want to put the brutal violence against my people aside to appreciate the beauty of the land and the beauty of the fact that my ancestors walked all over this country. And so I would talk to them and I would sing to them and I do so in every one of my walks. This one is called Asutewak. Asutewak means hearts walking together. Because when you're walking with your heart, you're walking with the people in a very genuine and sincere way with such a kindness and openness. And that's what we need in these walks. So I invite you to listen to this first poem. And thank you, thank you, Matthew, for writing this beautiful book. We walk through the tall grass, peeled clusters of choke cherries or Saskatoons. Twelve or more walkers staggered along prairie paths of dirt, gravel, sand, and wayward wagon trails. We skirted around the bulls, examined cow skeletons, listened for rattlesnakes, peered over the cliffs at a bloated carcass as the eagle souped and fed. We sat on the lip of the rocks to cool our feet. On the riverbanks, we sprinkled tobacco. We shared raisins, granola bars, dry meat, drinks, and nuts. Roll pants to expose legs filmed with dirt, remove boots and socks to nurse blistered feet, laid on our backs to stretch tight thighs. We hiked from Morlatch to Gravelberg, left tobacco at Old Wives Lake to the grandmothers who tended their last fire. Then from Humboldt to Fort Carlton, sitting as we left an old gravesite. We camped in a farmer's orchard, feasted on their apples and cherries and sang in their quonset. From Val Marie to Fort Walsh, we scrambled up and down to search for signs that marked the way, pushed through the grasslands at 38 degrees as the land and rocks simmered in radiant heat. We camped at Cypress Lake, swam and drank the grandmother we camped at Cypress Lake, swam and dreamt the grandmother sang and walked my friend and me across the lake. We descended upon the mystery rocks, 
paid our respect to the great mystery and the murdered ancestors. From Humble through Duck Lake to Fort Carlton, a farm dog followed for miles until we piled into the truck to leave him behind. We camped at Fort Battleford near the hanging of our former fathers, visited Poundmaker's grave, prayed our thanks and respect and reassured them that we are still here. We camped across, we came across Trump followers, Métis farmers that fed us. At Kinderdine Homestead, a plaque is dedicated to the Reverend whose native wife remained nameless, unknown. As she hello Baptist Church, 12 black families remain nameless on white crosses. In those many miles, oil pumps now occupy the northern prairie. Some walk for purpose, others for the joy of the land. All of us are dedicated to our private celebrations. Each carries the spirit of the other, friends from all walks of life sharing this journey. Hi, hi. Thank you, all my relations. I um, I thought maybe I'd read a very short section only because I see these two folks up there. Up, oh. is that okay? Thank you. There are two folks sitting here, and they, as often happens at these readings this week, there are folks who happen to be sitting here who are featured in the book, and some of you. Uh, there's a, a Lutheran pastor here who fed us cookies. And I don't know, can you just put your hand up? Uh, and, and I just want to say that giving gifts to pilgrims is an ancient, ancient tradition that you did for us. Thank you. Um, but another one is uh, uh, talking about going into ranching country near Cypress Hills. I just want to do this. Um, Once again, the day was brutally hot. Except for vapor trails, the sky was empty. The horizon was empty also of anything, even fencing, the only sounds muted conversations and our boots on the gravel. Catherine had had the good sense to bring a parasol. She chatted while she strolled, the most comfortable of any of us. I've always admired the easy and generous way that she moves through the world. I was thankful that Richard had left me his Australian hat but I was aware that he would soon be back and wanting it. When we finally arrived at, the, at an abandoned farmyard that Hugh had arranged for our tent sites that evening, there was a problem. It didn't seem to be abandoned. A new truck sat outside a house that clearly had been recently renovated. No one was home, but our phones picked up a strong Wi-Fi network. <laughs> we conferred and decided to set up our tents in a thicket of overgrown poplars, aspens, and caraganas about a kilometer north. There we tramped down the long grasses, their scent and that of clover sticking to our legs. The evening turned into one of those glorious, long, russet sunsets for which the prairies are famous. You know them here. I made a large pot of curried beef stew for my rations. Now, if you don't know that my, uh, what I lived on, I, I applied for a great big grant that was gonna give me a Cadillac pilgrimage experience. <laughs> But I didn't get the Cadillac pilgrimage experience because I didn't get the grant. <laughs> and so what happened was that, uh, fortunately, my brother and sister-in-law were kind enough to lend me their van and look, overlook the fact that I got it so muddy and so dirty. And my other, my sister and brother-in-law from Medicine Hat said, we'll take care of your food. And when I arrived in, uh, in Swift Kirk, there was a box waiting for me. And I uh, said, what's this? And opened it up and it was full of expired British army rations. <laughs> <laughs> so I made my first trip on expired British army rations, which actually are pretty good. <laughs> anyway, here I made a large pot of curried beef stew for my rations. Our new group of pilgrims watched 
the light linger while crickets sang and nighthawks dove. When we set up our tents, we had had to choose between two sides of barbed wire fence. We decided on the north side. When I stuck out my head from my tent the next morning, I realized we'd been fortunate. Four very large bulls were watching our tents from the south side of the barbed wire. After that surprise, we set out for another day of trekking. First, it was back down into the last arm of the White Mud River Valley, an expanse that opened before us like a walker's dream. Hugh informed us that it was the dry coulee grazing co-op, a pasture pulled into a commons by a group of ranchers, the type of arrangement that Trevor Harriet and other prairie conservationists advocate for because it better preserves prairie habitat. We were walking into ranching country. On the undisturbed grass, we came across at least a dozen lodge rooms. And one of the things we consistently discovered on these walks, you learn things at four kilometers an hour. And one of the things we consistently discovered was how dense population on the so-called sparsely populated prairies has been for millennia. It's only become sparsely populated lately. You get out on that land and you see the lodgings and you realize that what happened in settlement was depopulation, the clearing of the plains. Skulls of old bulls leered at us from the earth, horns curling around toward their eye sockets. Once I walked by a double line of stones that looked like it might mark a grave. As had happened near Pinto Horse Butte, with such a wide expanse of prairie grass and no clear markers, our group slowly spread out. Hugh had said to head west. It was great instructions, head west. <laughs> Eventually you'll hit a rail line, he told us. That'll be the southwest line, a private branch used by locals. Turn left. <laughs> we were to follow it south where Hugh had told us it would eventually lead to the Lois and Roland LaSalle farmyard. Unfortunately, on the open prairie, one loses track of both time and distance. We kept walking and walking. A Swainson's hawk circled above. I remembered what a farmer had said in Val Marie. The gophers gone means the hawks went away. There used to be so many gophers they had patches on them. Some kind of sickness. Now they're gone. At some point, we realized that Hugh and Simon, these two folks right here, who had been walking more slowly, were no longer behind us. We skidded down a steep, scrabbly hill of river stones and cactus and emerged onto a muddy alkali plain. Had Hugh told us about this? No one seemed to remember anything about the reservoir that we now saw to the north. We kept it to our right, following a beaten down fence line along a dank irrigation ditch our noses full of a sour alkali smell. Eventually, confused, we conferred. We were still headed west, but was it the right path? Either Hugh and Simon were lost, unlikely. There had been some kind of accident and they were delayed, slightly less unlikely, or we ourselves had strayed, most likely. <laughs> As it had been the case throughout most of the trail, there was no mobile phone coverage. At least we were a group of four. If we were lost, then we were lost together. And then we heard a shout. Far ahead and on a ridge to the south, two tiny figures waved. Hugh and Simone had decided to take a shortcut and walk straight across the hills. Now, why they didn't tell us about the shortcut? I'm not quite sure. But in any case, that's the reading. I'd like to invite Kristen to come. Yeah, I'll help Kristen. So much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Lenz Cavanaugh. I'm the executive director of the Saskatchewan History and Folklore Society, and so, so pleased to have had a part in these walks, of course, um, ably um, coordinated and spearheaded by our, our president, Hugh Henry. Um, and our trails convener. So um, we're just really excited to be part of, part, a little bit part of this process. And so I've been asked to um, help with the Q&A this evening. So I thought what I would do was I had a, a few questions for Matthew and I can maybe ask a couple of questions to get us started and then maybe we'll turn it over to the audience. We have an, an extra microphone for you um, to ask your questions. So I'll maybe start with a question to get us warmed up and then maybe we'll see uh, what other questions might come forward if that works. The reason I brought my phone is because I, I have my long list of questions here um, already. But 
so I think maybe what I'll, I'll start with, um, I have a presentation. Of you are here. Go to it. Um, I think what I want to start with is maybe a question about writing and for the writers in the audience. Um, we all know a little bit about how the, when you read the book, you find out about how the concept of the trails and the walks got started, how you've been thinking about it for many years, and eventually you fell in with Hugh and this became kind of a reality. And at what point did the walks, um, what, at what point did you start to think, well, maybe this should be a book? How did that process work for you? So the question is, what, at what point did I think it should become a book? Uh, the first uh, thought, I actually didn't think it was going to be a book. I brought along camera equipment and recording equipment and uh, did interviews on that first walk. And I thought it would be a documentary. And I still have that footage. And so maybe it will someday be a, a documentary. But I think what happened was that I had done a couple of documentaries. And I was really tired. Uh, they, they're quite, uh, when you do it by yourself, it's a, it's a terrible amount of work and somehow I thought a book would be easier. <laughs> but I, I think it was that I had start, I started writing because um, sometimes you just write because that's the way of getting your thoughts out. And what happened was that I had been writing and getting my thoughts out and I realized it was it was working out. And being an academic at the same time, I was researching and writing. And then after it just get bigger and bigger, the kind of reflections, and eventually I realized this is turning into uh, turning into a book, a nonfiction book. And so um, I hadn't thought at first it would be. I thought at first it was going to be a documentary. And it might still, something might still come out of that footage, I hope. I'll ask one more question. We can turn it over to the audience. So you mentioned this already, and I, I was privileged enough to get to be uh, for a couple of days on some of the walks. Um, and so one of the things that I really noticed and really was, one, was wonderful, and I think a lot of other people felt the same way, was this sense of fellowship. So chatting while walking, but also while setting up tents and eating their meals and singing songs at the end of the night. And so there's wonderful fellowship that made the walk so incredibly special. So I had a question about that. Um, did some of the conversations that came out during this these times of fellowship, how did those influence the book and the concepts in the book? <laughs> uh, they did, for sure. Um, uh, the, I mean, we are who we are because of our encounters. We bring a certain history with us, but maybe that, even that is encounters with the ancestors. But we bring, we... Uh, we we are changed, you, you know, uh, you've experienced this in your life. You're changed by the people you meet, by the company you keep. And um, you bring something to that as a gift and you receive something back. And so how was I changed? Uh, I Just because Louise is sitting right there, I remember, I don't know if you remember, but sitting under a tarp, we, it was so hot and we had pulled this, I think, Canadian tire tarp over our heads, like you and me, and, and I think... Louise Million was there, and I'm not sure who else. And we were just chatting. Now, only on the prairies do you pull a Canadian tire tarp, 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 tarp over your heads and sit there for an hour and chat um, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. And uh, But I learned something about how uh, you looked at land and how Louise Million looked at land and Tara from walking looked at land. And, you know, um, we uh, when I said we become who we are by encountering others, uh, the what is officially called dialogue happens when we listen and when we have time to listen. And sometimes it's because we don't want to listen. And there's a lot of that happening right now, just the, you know, this stuff. But sometimes it's because we don't have the time or take the time to listen. And one of the great advantages of walking is that you, you kind of get bored, but good bored. You know how they say about kids that kids now need, you know, kids now, kids now need more boredom? Well, adults now need more boredom too. We all need more boredom, meaning we need time to just let our, you know, let the screens go, let the concerns go a little bit, get so bored that thoughts bubble up and that you talk to your neighbor and you learn something about it. And I learned on that walk something about how um, my indigenous neighbors look at land differently than I do and why they look at it that way. And uh, so I'm, you know, a slightly older than middle-aged white guy 
with uh, and when I when I when I'm a white guy with a passport and a credit card and a cell phone. I mean, I I am master of the world. I, I don't mean that literally, but you know <laughs> what I mean is that you know a white guy with a passport and a, and a credit card and a cell phone can go anywhere they want, but, you know, in, in a lot of places. That's not true of many other walkers, and I started to learn that. That for me, you know, walking down a gravel road and seeing a half ton come toward me, whatever, you know, do I have to talk to this person or not? For my indigenous fellow walkers, that might not be the same experience. For me, walking into, uh, especially this was true in our, our Swift Current to Battleford walk, walking into a farmyard to ask about something, uh, no particular problem for me, for the indigenous fellow walkers, especially when we walked in 20, um, 18, yeah, 2018, a whole different scenario. Um, but not, okay, so that's indigenous, but even for my fellow, uh, for the uh, uh, walkers amongst us who were women, how, what was their experience like? And you know, um, that was one thing that you learned. This is a long answer to a short question. Um, one of the things you learn when walking is that you learn what's it like for other people and what, how do they look at the land differently? And uh, I've just been completely enriched in ways that I hope enrich the volume. Um, one way was also getting to know land in a way that isn't threatening. The indigenous fellow, uh, my, you know, talking to Richard, for instance, was talking to somebody for whom the land was a friend in a way that it wasn't quite for me. Um, I grew up in, in that part of Saskatchewan as a writer. I grew up uh, with the kind of um, Saskatchewan, you know, Saskatchewan novels. Um, you know, everybody freezes to death between the house and the barn in the middle of a blizzard in the winter after 45 years of living there and never telling their partner that they loved them, but it's found in a drawer. And that's the tragedy. You know, okay, that's not exactly all of them. But you know, that's a troll. And so there's a lot of kind of garrison mentality. It was Northbrook Fry, I think, was it? Who called that the garrison mentality of Canadian writing? And so there's this way of looking at nature as a Canadian which has been invoked in us, and which is this idea of other. You know, don't turn your back on nature; it will destroy us. And um, and uh, because of Richard and other and Louise and others, I learned to see it slightly differently. I saw I saw you can pull the Saskatoons off as you did in your poem with the choke cherries. I'd never eaten choke cherries off, you know, right off the tree like that, and popped them into my mouth until I was so thirsty that they were really good. <laughs> and, and we learned things like that. So I don't know if that answers it. it. It did beautifully. Yes, thank you. So I think with that, let's turn it over to the audience. Um, we must have questions for Matthew. I have, I have lots of questions, so I can just keep going. But I'd like to give it a shot for other folks who might have a question about, about writing or about the land or the walks or the trails. Yeah, if you'd like to raise your hand, I can bring the microphone to you. So everyone. Matthew, um, I was wondering if you could reflect a bit about your experience as a, a Lutheran pastor walking through some of those areas in Saskatchewan. You probably came through Lutheran churches and just your sense of pilgrimage as a spiritual journey. Uh, that's, that's a bigger question, but um, yeah, I'd like to hear some of that. So Lyndon is a fellow Swift Current kid <laughs> of a different generation. Um, so uh, sort of the Lutheran background for me. So, the, so you know, I should have maybe started talking about me and myself and my positionality. What you call academia, you call your positionality. And otherwise, you just say, here's who I am in my relations, which is another way of saying positionality. But I'm from Swift Current. I grew up in Treaty 4, as, as you said, Jasper, at the very beginning. And I'm also a Lutheran, I'm an ordained Lutheran pastor as well as a, I guess I never decided a professor and a bunch of other things. But um, as a minister, it was interesting, for instance, to walk to Kyle. So I'm walking north from um, Swift Current to Kyle. So I start off, walk, you walk past St. Olaf's Lutheran Church, where I grew up. Uh, my parents went to St. Olaf's Lutheran Church. Now, Olaf is the, uh, in, I had walked Norway, in Norway to St. Olaf's Shrine in Trondheim, Trondheim, Norway. And uh, so that's a part of that history. And then walk north through the landing and then up. And there's a church there. Is it Zion? The country church? Yeah. So Zion, a little white church that we walked by. 
And um, I that was I'd been a student minister who had preached at Zion Lutheran Church in that country church. And then we came to Kyle and uh, your, your, Pastor Urano <laughs> um, uh, was kind enough on the Sunday morning to give us cookies as we walked out. And, there, you know, uh, because I knew that, the, the sh that you were there and that the church was there and uh, Pastor Fred Ludolf who walked with us, uh, we stopped by. And I will get to the more spirituality in a second, but it was interesting that on that walk, we had a Catholic archbishop we had a, a United Church lay minister who's here somewhere, Connie, I don't know where you are, right there. Uh, we had uh, two Lutheran pastors. Did we have anybody else who was with the Were named in some way? No. That was enough. That was enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had four of us who were kind of official in some way. We didn't really think about it that way, but we were kind of four who were official in some way. And you know what the ceremony was that brought us all together? Was it the Eucharist? You know, no. Was it preaching? No. Was it matins? No. Was it was it chanting of, of another sort, of an interface sort? No. It was smudging. And we were, we did, uh, you know, it was because we could then all participate. But it isn't it interesting that it took smudging to bring the Catholic Archbishop and the Protestant ministers together in some way. So that's the kind of more official part. Spirituality of walking. Um, pilgrimage is a transformational journey. So if you walk and you are transformed or seek transformation in some way, that is a pilgrimage and can be a pilgrimage for you. So these walks were transformational, sometimes on purpose and sometimes in ways that we didn't even understand at first. And that made them pilgrimages for me um, and spiritual for me. And the very last point, sorry to go on so long, I'm a professor as well. <laughs> the very last point about that is that uh, it's particularly a problem with Protestants, Protestant Christians, is that um, the theology of, Pro I won't not give a lecture on theology, but the theology has been divorced from the body and from the land for far too long. It's been all about here, what's here. It's become that a bit too much. And so what happens in pilgrimage is you can't help being connected to the land because your feet hurt. Your feet hurt, and you're hot or you're cold, you, you've got, um, uh, you know, you've got, you've got spear grass sticking into the top of the top of your feet are very sensitive to spear grass, and you've got that sticking in. You feel, you feel things all the time, and we need, uh, especially those of us who are Protestant background, need to get out of our heads sometimes and back into our bodies and back paying attention to the land. And we learn that spirituality from our fellow walkers from the first peoples who've always experienced that spirituality and from being on pilgrimage. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to read the book. Can you talk a little bit about how you chose the walks that you chose? Like what did, what was it about the three walks that you, that you chose and uh, are there more yet to come? Uh, so I'll answer the first part first. How did I choose it? And I'm going to say that um, for that very first one, um, I thought it would be really great to walk uh, the Northwest Mounted Police Patrol Trail, which is also called the Traders Walk, the Traders Road. And I learned very early on that what you call it makes a difference. Is it the Northwest Mounted Police Patrol Trail or is it the Traders Road? One is a settler name, one is an indigenous name. The, the, the Métis name. Um, and I thought I was going to walk that. But then I learned pretty early on that I didn't know where I was going, really. I talked to um, Jim Daschuk in Regina, author of Clearing the Plains. And I said, we're going to walk the Northwest Mounted Police Patrol Trail. And he said, uh, <laughs> do you mean, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, the one the one that they marched west on. And, he's, and the one down by the border. He said, they didn't march down by the border. So... <laughs> I clearly hadn't done my research as carefully as I thought. And I learned that the, you know, do you know the highway? The uh, 13. Yeah, Highway 13, Red Coat Trail. Well, that is not, on, uh, on the one side, that's not exactly the Mountain the Mount Police Patrol Trail slash Traders Road. And it's neither is it where the RCMP Great March came west. So I didn't quite know where I was going, is the short answer. And it took Hugh uh, to clear me up and Jim, Jim Daschuk and a few other people who cleared me up. 
So I knew I wanted to see Cypress Hills Wood Mountain, but I didn't quite know how to do that. Great idea. Fools and angels are saved by Hugh Henry and others. <laughs> this is not this one, folk um, uh, The other walk, uh, one of the other walks detailed in here was from um, Swift Current to Battleford. And I became interested in that as I realized that it was not, again, not exactly, but close to the clear, the, the, one of the roads of clearance. And it was interesting also because I grew up in Swift Current for my elementary education. And this tells you something. I learned about, you know, we were learning about the Brits, the bad old English. Sorry if you're from England, but the bad old English and their pith helmets fighting against the Boers in South Africa, you know, the Boer War, which was a... Uh, of um, a war of pacification against an indigenous population. And we learned about that and how bad that was. And we learned that in Swift Current while we were going to track meets on the south side of Swift Current and the, and the dirt banks still probably have some shell casings from the first practice of the Gatling gun on Canadian soil or are perhaps one of the first uses of the Gatling gun as target practice on, on the Canadian soil because Colonel Otter arrived in Swift Current with a force to march north against the real resistance and took along a Gatling gun. So isn't that interesting that I grew up learning about the Boer War and how bad the Brits were there when there had been almost identical uh, war of pacification against an indigenous population to secure land for settler expansion and make economics go on. But I only learned about this one, not this one. And why was that? So I wanted to learn more about it, and we went on the walk north from the Swift Current to Battleford. If you've ever been to Swift Current, um, my when I told my brother, who's also here, I said, we're going to walk the Battleford Trail. And he said, oh, you mean the Dairy Queen Trail? <laughs> because, because if you go on the service, service road, the, uh, the, the linear parks route is right beside the Dairy Queen. <laughs> and so he was teasing me. He knew the right thing. But, um, so does that answer the question? I think you had a third part. Oh, about future walks. I'm going to let you talk to Saskatchewan History and Folklore Society about that. Um, but I, I think that Fort Hugh has done the yeoman's journey for a long, long time and, and may, may be uh, check it out. But I will say that if you are interested in local walking, there are other opportunities. And many of you are walkers already. I know I met folks from the Saskatoon chapter of the Canadian uh, com the com Canadian Company of Pilgrims. Um, and May Pennock is somewhere over there. Um, and uh, and these folks also lead uh, walks. And um, and even in local, like in your local communities, I you know, all through Swift Current, uh, Regina, uh, here, Saskatoon's great for this. You take a walk and you change your purpose slightly to focus on the history of what's going on and you, you'd be surprised what you discover. For now, do that and then become a member of Saskatchewan History and Folklore Society and see what levels up. Um, thank you. I, I think it's time for another piece of poetry before we do another question. Is that, would that be okay? Um, you know, um, I'm really thankful for, Larry's not here tonight, but I apparently he was in Regina. He was one of our drivers. And um, so if it wasn't for our drivers hauling our stuff around and bringing us back to our vehicles and um, Connie's here. Connie? She was one of our volunteer drivers as well. Uh, made our life so much easier. And uh, one of the things I like about myself is I'm really nosy. <laughs> I, I want to know the story of people's lives, okay? So like with um, Don Bolin, who's the Archbishop Bishop of uh, Regina or Saskatchewan, I don't understand that stuff. Anyway. <laughs> but, um, I like to take people's hats off and find out who in the world they are on a human level. And so I asked Don, why did you come and become a priest anyway? Like, weren't you ever in love? <laughs> <laughs> I asked the same of Rianne, the nun who walked with us. 
didn't you ever sleep around? Like, <laughs> you know, when you get to know a person, you can ask these things. But to me, it's about breaking those taboos of, like, we can't talk about that. <laughs> like, I hear people say, you know, women don't disclose their ages. I think, what's up with that? <laughs> I'm 71. I'm so, I love being telling people that because I never expected to live that long. Anyway, here's called Walking the Grief. The drum released the thunder, lightning struck bet my, between my eyes, sizzled my heart. Razor sharp rain, spear grass pierced the skin. My feet crunched the prairie landscape, followed the obliterated moccasins of my ancestors. Sweet grass, sage, dry grass filled the air. Purple-headed prairie clover swayed, became round dancing woman, and for a while the birds' paws remained silent. Merlach to gravel bird, old wives lake, a massacre. Belva reach grasslands national park, a thirst walk, horse skeletons, east end, cypress lake, a starvation. At the lake I dreamt, a friend and I in ribbon skirts walk across the waters accompanied by the grandmothers, their songs lifting us up. The Northwest Mountain Police Trail to Fort Walsh, Palis Palisades, starvation, another massacre. Humble to Fort Carlton, a treaty conveniently forgotten. The settlers think they are surrounded. Ancestors fed them, showed them how to survive. I remember all my relations, cousins, brothers, fathers, uncles, grandfathers, mothers, aunties, grandmothers. The lost, missing, murdered indigenous women are my kin. My father and uncle walked my grandfather out the door before his last breath to drink in the land. Marked at birth the devil's print on my left breast. It disappeared when I lifted this pen. The buffalo's hooves are on this page. Thank you, all my relations. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. I think I think I'm hearing that we have time for one more question. One more question. <laughs> one one more question for this part, though, and I'm sure you can chat with Matthew afterwards. Anyone have another question? Okay, I have a question. So if you've been on the walks and you'll, you'll see when you read the book, um, there's all kinds of camaraderie, especially in terms of making haikus, but there's also a lot, it seems to me, a lot of talk of blisters. So my, my final question is, what advice would you have for a new walker who has discovered they have their first blister? Well, if you read the book, you'll see that I didn't take my own advice on the second walk. Um, uh, have good boots that fit your feet. Once you've walked a thousand kilometers, get rid of the old ones. Don't try and walk in them again. But for new walkers who are starting to experience blisters, I've got two words for you. Duct tape. <laughs> now, that works for me. It doesn't always work for everyone, but I there are some long-distance walkers here. I like duct tape because I've gotten to an age where my toes have started to move in strange directions <laughs> and rub against each other. And duct tape, you know, it works. You put a little bit of duct tape on and it slides against duct tape like that. You can pull it off. Another way that this is not what this book is about. <laughs> but another uh, mechanism, a good mechanism that some people use is Vaseline. Yeah. Vaseline between your toes and you can put your socks on over that. The problem for me with prairie walking and Vaseline is, is grit. 
is dust. It gets in and gets into that. It's like, you know, oil, it in oil and starts to rub between the pieces. That's why I prefer the duct tape. Duct tape and WD-40, but just duct tape. Um, so I guess that's, uh, Jasper, if you want to say something. I would, I could talk all evening about this book because I love it. And I'm so glad uh, Louise talked at the end about relations. I mean, all my relations is is an indigenous way of expressing Lakota Lynn is, is well, not according to me, but uh, relationship, re yeah. re relationality. Yeah. And um, those of us who are not Indigenous, we need to refine our resources and learn from Indigenous uh, without appropriating it yet again as a resource, but learn as one might from an elder, and then also learn from our own backgrounds. Uh, my pilgrimages in uh, and, and walks in Norway, for instance, and in the Scandinavian countries taught me that in those places where some of us our ancestors came from, they talk about the commons. They have private land, but they have a public interest in things that happen on private land. There's a you, you may own a piece of property, but you other people have a right to certain things and a certain access and to other things. And we can discover things in our own background that may help us be better treaty partners, which is the form of relationality into which we've been put here on Turtle Island. So, Jasper, thank you. So sorry, I'm doing this short here, but we do want everyone to get a signed copy before the store closes. Uh, so we have copies up here at the desk uh, where Matthew and I believe Louise will also be here to sign your book if you would like it. Uh, I've also got some more copies on the desk at the back there and you're welcome to get your book signed before you take it to cash to buy it. So that's absolutely fine. Thank you again so much to Matthew and Louise and Dave and Tom and Kristen for all being here tonight. Thank you all for coming out and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. I think we'd like to have a photo with all the walkers if we could up here.